Okay, let's go for it then. Let's have a look at this friction topic. I've just got a couple of slides here that are going to overview friction um, and how useful friction can be and also how um, sort of disadvantaged friction can be as well also. Um, and then I'll get into your notes and we'll get into some basic questions. What's nice about the friction model that we're going to use, it's an empirical model, there's no proof behind the friction formula we're going to look at, um, but it's a very simple uh, formula, very simple a model to use, um, which is reasonably accurate. Uh, it depends on the applications, but it's reasonably accurate. And engineers do use this uh, with all sorts of other theories in belt drive, friction belt drives, friction clutches. This theory that we're going to look at today is part of that process of developing through the formula. So, so it is something that is used, uh, it just has to be used with caution at times. Unfortunately, uh, Newton's second law and even Newton's first law will crop up in a couple of the questions. So that's the boo, hiss, hiss kind of um, response I expect I'll get from you. Um, because friction normally occurs in other topic areas. It kind of is something that occurs in motion, for example. Or if you want to move something that's at rest, you've got to overcome friction effects and so on. So it cro crops up in other topics. Now, friction is one of those properties which is a, a, a friend or a foe. It depends on your perspective. I'm looking here more at like design sort of orientated aspects here. But even in basic usage, without friction, there's many things we couldn't do. For example, we couldn't walk on a slippery floor easily. You imagine trying to walk on an ice rink, for example, you know how difficult that can be. So without friction, we couldn't walk easily along the pavement. Uh, we couldn't climb a ladder, as it shows at the bottom of the screen there. We couldn't use our brake discs in our cars. We, we couldn't even screw a nut and a bolt together without friction because they work purely on friction forces. Tires only grip roads because of frictions and you couldn't warm your hands if you didn't have friction. You couldn't rub them together and generate any heat. So some basic functions there that we cannot do without friction effects. And even uh, things like clamping, when you want to clamp uh, something in a G-clamp or in a vice or you want to use a jubilee clip, without friction, none of them work. They're absolutely useless. If you want to uh, use um, a magnetic chuck, which is a question later on, a magnetic chuck, for example, holding the component on the work surface. Part of that is due to the, uh, the, the generated forces there to hold the, the component on the magnetic chuck is down to friction. Your trains wouldn't run on time. I know some of you might say trains don't run on time, but trains couldn't run on time if they didn't have friction effects between the, the steel tires of the wheels and the steel tracks. We need friction effects to drive the train. Parachutes won't work without friction. You couldn't start a fire without friction so it's really useful and lots and lots of applications we don't even think about I've had my shoelaces at the moment it sounds stupid this but my shoes keep coming undone that's because of the lack of friction between laces um, when I tie them together and it's a real nuisance because they keep coming undone um, so you know friction keeps shoelaces tied and it's a, a nuisance when you can't tie a shoelace properly so, so we need friction for all these basic techniques so friction is an advantage, it's a friend as I termed it there in, in applications, um, but also, also friction is what's termed a foe, it's a disadvantage in lots of applications. I mean something quite obvious if you just wanted to try and move an object across the floor here, you would have to overcome the friction effects, which we'll be talking about in a moment, uh, between in this case the block and the floor, there'll be a friction effect that will oppose us here, I call it frictional force that'll be opposing that motion so to to pull something along a workshop floor for example to move a piece of machinery which have to in the past you know in manual effort it's quite difficult to sometimes move a heavy object if you're in the aircraft industry one of the principal aspects of aircraft design is the aerodynamics obviously of the exterior and there's, there's a whole raft of engineers that are looking at the profile of the wings the profile of the fuselage and so on getting the lines correct so the aerodynamic drag is reduced because obviously friction on, on the aircraft is um you know, frictional drag is quite a kind of problem so a lot of engineers spend an awful lot of time trying to remove the frictional drag uh, if you're designing engines for example terrific amount of work has been done over years on typology analyzing fluids that are used in engines to reduce friction effects and give longer life and so on so so again you know, when you're designing reciprocating engines friction is a nuisance you're trying to design it out um, because it causes fretting it causes wear and so on and one of the things I relate to when I was an apprentice, I used to work for an electric motor manufacturer. And these electric motors were really long lasting. They would last 
you know, decades. In fact, I think at the time the company were, were saying how I think Tower Bridge was still using their motors 50 years on. They were lasting so long. But what they didn't tell you is that they probably had umpteen bearings replaced in that time because one of the things that always seemed to wear on, on the motors was these bearings it's shown here. The amount of time I know engineers were trying to expend on trying to find different ways of lubricating the bearings, um, um, oil some, in some in, uh, motors they were trying to design just to relieve the, the friction associated with the bearings and then give longer life to the uh, to the motors and so on before they need to repair. So that's where friction is a bit of a foe. It's a bit of a nuisance. So it's kind of um, swings in roundabouts depending on the, the, your perspective uh, from design. Sometimes you want to increase the frictional effects because that helps the design. Sometimes you just want to eliminate them as best you can because that helps the design. So uh, think of friction as being good and bad depending on um, the application. This is actually on the front cover of your notes, this is where we're starting from. And again, I've got applications here where friction is a friend and friction is a foe. If you're designing belt drives, we mentioned belt drives in a few, few weeks ago in another lecture. Belt drives, one of the main characteristics of a friction belt drive is the frictional contact between the belt and the pulley. So in this particular case, what the uh, engineers would be trying to do would be increasing this friction effect where the contact of the belt with the pulley is, if I draw it in red here, that's called the uh, sort of angle of lap there effectively. Um, they try and increase the angle of lap, they try and increase the frictional effects there, they may use V-belts, we mentioned V-belts or rope belts, have V-groove pulleys to try and increase the friction effects, so do whatever they can to increase the friction uh, of the driving pulley there to prevent slip, and give more torque and more power. That's, that's the design characters they're trying to look for, increase friction effects here. But of course if you were designing the bearing, the bearings here, obviously there'll be bearings in the centre. Be the exact opposite there with those bearings, you'd be doing you'd doing whatever you could to remove friction effects from the design. Um, so within that one application you've got friction as the friend and friction as the foe there. And sometimes in industry you, you may have come across these, they're called journal bearings here, friction in journal bearings. Um, and they're, uh, they're uh, radial bearings that show there in a journal bearing here. That's when you've got a shaft in a recess here, so you've got metal on metal and the shaft is turning here. So you've got friction effects around here. And again, you would try what you could to lubricate that system to try and remove the frictional effects as best you can to, to increase the life of the, of the design there. So again, friction friend info depending on the design. Just going to show you, show you a couple of slides. They're not in your notes, these, but it doesn't really matter because it's just sort of more background here. Dry friction we'll, we'll consider initially here uh, in this slide. So the simplest explanation of, of friction effects is when uh, dry and clean surfaces rub together. The friction in that case is due to the surface roughness. Now, when you look at a surface, this sort of block here is trying to show you two, two surfaces in contact here. When you actually study closely under a microscope, for example, these surfaces, it's, it's quite apparent that uh, even if they look smooth surfaces, they're not. They're full of hills and valleys, as it's trying to show you there, uh, correctly termed asperities. Okay, that's a technical name for them, asperities. And that's what you see under a microscope. You see the peaks in the trough here. And there's a tendency when you slide the two components over each other, you've got to imagine the a top plate, if you like, is sliding in that direction and the bottom one sliding in that direction. Uh, when, you, when you slide them across, there's a tendency for, the, a tendency for each surface to shear the tips of these irregular, uh, irregularities, these asperities as they're sometimes termed. And what effectively happens is here, those two plates sit on the tips, if you like, they sit on the projecting heels on the high spots on the surfaces. They actually bear on those surfaces, not across the entire surface, although it looks like they're bearing across the entire surface, they're not. They're just bearing on the, uh, the asperities as such. So the true area of contact between two plates, as shown here, is actually very much less than the apparent area of contact. The apparent area would be sort of the apparent area would be effectively the uh, length here multiplied by the width. That would be what's called the apparent area in our uh, little model here. But the true area of contact, the area that, where the two plates actually do contact, is often much less than the apparent area because of these peaks and troughs on the actual um, microscopic surface you've got. 
So at average load, the area of a true contact is proportional to the load applied. So almost independent of the apparent area. This is a, a general finding. There's no theory here to prove this. It's, it's an, what's called an empirical formula here. It's, it's in testing, but that seems to be the case. So friction force is determined by the area of what's called true contact and is proportional to the load it's applied and almost, not quite, but almost independent of the apparent area of contact. It does depend on the situation. If you've got extremely high pressures, extremely high forces pushing the plates together, then the model falls over a little bit. That's, that is no longer quite true. But for general applications in the industry, you most likely come across the theory about the uh, true area of contact being smaller than the apparent area is quite valid. And the ratio of the friction force to load, you'll see this in a moment, symbol mu, is thus constant for a given pair of surfaces. So you'll see in a minute there'll be a table of what's called friction coefficients. This mu symbol uh, here is a Greek symbol we use to define what's called a friction coefficient. And they're standard values you kind of look up in a table or look up on the internet. Um, and they relate to a pair of surfaces. You'll see this in a moment. So going back to your notes then, just to uh, summarise, we've said initially that friction is friend or foe. It plays an important part in everyday life. With, well, without friction, we couldn't, I said we couldn't walk. I couldn't write on my tablet here without it. I couldn't write on my paper without it. Um, and in the engine environment, of course, we've already said there's lots of applications where we need friction effects, okay? We do know that sometimes it can be a nuisance. Uh, friction can require extra energy to operate machinery to overcome the frictional forces. So as I said before, designers can go to great lengths to try and reduce the friction effects with maybe lubrication or grease or materials uh, tight surface finishes, all sorts of different ways. They try their best to reduce friction, okay? So friction causes wear, which can give rise to safety issues. Obviously, things can then fail. They get mechanical failures, but it can be quite severe in some instances. So we do our best if we, to remove friction in some applications. Other applications, we do our best to increase it. So friction uh, is, relates to two surfaces pressed together, and they're trying to slide over uh, one over the other. Um, that resistance is experienced is due to this friction setup and by the mating surfaces. I already said it's because of the peaks in troughs on the surface that are sort of shearing each other as they go across from left to right uh, and right to left. So just for your reference, you might want to uh, fill in your notes. You've got these gaps here. You might want to put down some examples where friction is a friend. So friction effects are used in advantage in the following applications. I would encourage you in your notes just to put down a few that you've already mentioned. And underneath that, a couple where you think friction is a disadvantage, it's a foe. Here's my list of advantages, and that's when some of the people forget, but you couldn't put a, um, a nail into a piece of wood if you didn't have friction effects, it just wouldn't stay there. And when I was working electric motors, something I do remember a long time ago, they used to um, use a technique called friction welding um, to, to weld two parts of a shaft together. They would have the sort of left-hand side of the shafts rotating clockwise and the right-hand side would rotate anti-clockwise, and they would force the two shafts together and these friction effects uh, would heat up uh, materials and actually friction weld them together so i don't know if that technique is used so much now but certainly in my day friction welding was a technique that was used and um, without friction you couldn't do that you know so that's that's the benefit of friction and disadvantage already mentioned disadvantages okay so there's a bit of background on friction um, and it's good and bad points now Okay, we're going to talk now about frictional forces. I'm going to slowly move towards this little model. What I like about this friction model is very simple. When you get to it, to it in a minute, you'll see it's a very simple model. Mathematics, it's really easy to, to manipulate. Um, so I like it. It's reason, reasonably accurate and it's quite easy to use. So frictional force I normally denote is F suffix F. That's just my notation. So the term frictional force is used to describe the force that's generated when two bodies, two plates, whatever it might, be are in contact and tending to slide over each other they don't have necessarily to be sliding they might just be about to slide but you've got that frictional effects to overcome now frictional force always opposes relative motion so if your mo mo movement is from left to right your frictional force will go from right to left if your movements from right to left your friction force goes left to right always opposes the motion between the two bodies that are in contact uh, there are two types of friction or static friction when something is stationary and you're trying to move it 
and dynamic friction it's also sometimes called kinetic friction that's where something's actually on the, on the move is actually moving at constant velocity so so i'm going to outline both of these types of friction for us so static friction static friction relates to the situation where the bodies are at rest okay they're stationary uh, and the frictional force is opposing the attempted motion so you might be trying to move this stationary object from left to right. You might be applying a force. It's not moving, um, but you're applying a force to it to try and overcome friction. The friction force is going from right to left and trying to say, hey, you're not going to move until you overcome me kind of thing. So um, it always opposes the, the relative motion. Dynamic friction, sometimes terms as kinetic friction. Dynamic friction occurs when two bodies are so moving with respect to each other. Um, and the frictional force is opposing the motion at constant velocity. So the frictional force is still opposing the motion. Um, we're assuming it's a constant velocity situation there. Okay. So factors that are affecting friction. Uh, the first one I've got there is materials in contact. The type of materials you're dealing with, if steel surfaces may be, they might rub better together than, say, steel on a brick, for example. Condition of the surfaces as well, item two. Um, if they're smooth surfaces then they will slide slightly better than if they're pitted or rusted surfaces or dusty or dirty surfaces because that would affect the friction that would increase the friction effects the force that holds the surfaces together the normal force it's holding the two plates together and that has an effect on friction the greater the force between the frictional surfaces then the um, um, greater the frictional effects and the lubrication that's the real biggie lubrication if you lubricate a surface it has a significant effect on the friction it reduces it considerably and going back to my days in the motor um, electric motor industry you know sometimes if they really wanted to reduce the friction effects they would actually use bearings that were oil lubricated that design an oil sump in the motor configuration have oil circulating so that's very costly cost uh, more costly castings to produce because the machinings but in some instances so they would put that expense in because lubricated um, bearings ask, last a lot longer than um, bearings that are sort of greased or, or unlubricated now here are the three laws of friction to be aware of they're called basic laws here um, governing friction and again we can't prove these laws but they're, they're they've come from empirical testing of so the laws governing friction between two dry and clean surfaces that are in contact here were posed by Amonton back in 1699. So you can see it's been around a while, um, almost as long as Newton's laws of motion has been around. So they must have um, some relevance because we're still teaching them, we're still using them today. But they're obtained from experimental data. So there's often called empirical formula in this case because um, it's an empirical formula generated because there's no proof for it, but it seems to work in practice But because testing shows that, that it works fairly well. So the first law is that friction force is almost independent of the surface area in contact. Okay. Second law, we've got that friction uh, force is directly proportional to the mass of the object tending to slide. The third one is that friction is quite clever because it always opposes relative motion. If you push to the left, it'll push to the right. If you push up, it will push down. It always opposes the relative motion. And there's a fourth one which doesn't affect us uh, in what we're going to do, but I've just put it in for, for reference here. At low speeds, frictional force is independent of the speed of, of sliding. First three are the ones that do underpin the work we're going to look at in this presentation. Okay. So the laws provide for the development of a very simple model. One of the reasons why engineers like it, even though it's not the most accurate of uh, techniques or formulas to use, it's just so simple to use uh, and, and it seems to be applicable to most uh, practical engineering situations. It gives a reasonable estimate uh, and friction forces involved in most general situations. What you do tend to see to find if you're designing with friction effects, you tend to have higher factors of safety to try and accommodate um, any errors that might creep in due to the assumptions made about the frictional effects. So I've only put these slides in, I don't know if they help, I'm just trying to illustrate the first two laws, that's all. The first law um, states that frictional force is almost independent of area. So if you've got something like this on the left hand side, I've got my plate, fairly thick plate here. It looks like it has an apparent area. The apparent area would be sort of the, you know, the, the lengths times the, the widths would give the apparent area, but the actual true area is much smaller than that. So I'm just showing that as a little shaded rectangle. That's, that's called the true area. That's the asperity is contacting each other. If I now take a, a plate of the same mass, which I'm showing on the right hand side here, the frictional force um, 
hasn't changed, even though the area now looks much bigger. The apparent area now of this plate would look much bigger. Uh, it looks sort of like almost twice the length and twice the width. It is, is a, a different thickness, it's thinner on the thickness because the mass of both plates are the same. But looking at the area characteristic, even though the area looks bigger, the actual true area between the contact of the surfaces is essentially the same as kind of uh, what the assumption is. So the frictional force is kind of independent of the area of the plate, even though the apparent areas look terrifically different, it doesn't make any great difference to the frictional force. Now, I'm trying to say that, that frictional force shown there is the same as that frictional force shown there, even though the plates look a lot bigger as far as their area is concerned. I don't know if that helps your understanding or not. And law two, this is to do with the fact that the friction force is proportional to the normal force that's applied. If you take the weight, the bigger the weight acting down, the bigger what's called the normal force here, then the bigger the friction would be. So that's what I'm trying to show here, that this frictional force here uh, that's generated from this plate is less than the frictional force here generated from this, this plate over here. So the bigger the, the weight force acting down in this case, if you like, the bigger the friction would occur. But I think that one's more reasonable to understand. And I think that makes more sense. There. Uh, you just think of it, a heavy object is more difficult to move than a lighter object. Uh, that, that's kind of more straightforward, I think. There are two types of friction already mentioned, static and dynamic friction. Um, we're always looking for the limiting friction forces. So I'm going to look first of all at static limiting friction force. This is a, a characteristic we often want to find when we're designing um, different components, different situations. Um, two surfaces are in contact and the force is applied until one of them uh, just begins to slide over the other. Then that's the minimum force required to overcome static friction. And that's often something we're quite interested in finding. And that's called the static limiting friction force. That's a characteristic we want to find in all the questions or in most of the questions. That's what we'll be trying to find. Once motion has been achieved, though, once we've overcome what's called the static limiting friction, the force required to maintain constant motion becomes slightly less thereafter to keep the motion uh, in progress. So the static limiting friction is the biggest friction force in our system. Once we overcome static limiting friction, we're into the dynamic friction phase. Uh, and, and dynamic friction is a lot less usually than static friction. And if we want to maintain motion, uh, something that is in motion, we want to find a force that maintains the constant motion, then we'll need to know what the dynamic limiting friction force would be, okay? But in most cases, it's a static frictional force we want to know. And this diagram tries to indicate this. I don't know if this will help you. This is a diagram of frictional force on the vertical axis in time on the horizontal axis here. What you see is that a force is being applied from zero here. So we're applying a force. So you might apply a force up to, say, this level. And if you let it go, what it's saying is you won't move your object because you haven't overcome the static limiting friction. I could apply a force from zero and get it up to here. OK, my force applied effectively now is getting to my top of my diagram. I'm sort of applying the force up to this level here, but I'm still not going to move my object because I haven't overcome the static limiting friction. If I apply a force all the way up to the top of the uh, diagram there, uh, and beyond there, if I apply force even greater, I'm now into motion. I will now overcome the static friction. The static limiting friction has been overcome and I will start to move the, uh, the component. OK, so that static limiting friction, that maximum value um, on our diagram is often something we're trying to find. This is the, this is the sort of maximum force here, a static limiting friction. Once we found that, we know we've got motion. And what you notice is when we're into dynamic motion, can you see how the frictional force suddenly drops? Because when you've got something moving, it's easier to keep it moving. It's easier to break the bonds, if you like, between the two surfaces once it's in motion. So dynamic friction is something that has lower forces involved than the static friction. So it's often static friction we're kind of interested in. Finding that static limiting friction force um, it is quite a key um, aspect of our calculations. Here's the frictional model. This is it. So all that spiel before is kind of leading up to this very simple frictional model. And it is quite simple. There's not much difficulty in transposing it. Um, just got to understand what the terms are. Three variable transposition. It's really quite a nice little model. 
I'm only going to look at friction on the horizontal plane, by the way. I'm not going to look at friction on the inclined plane. The things do get more complicated on the inclined plane. I leave that to a later lecture, um, but I, I, I just want us to get the basic techniques underway under our belt today with, uh, with friction. So, so this is the elementary model that's used to analyze the friction effects. What we've got here is a block, a body, some some um, object it might be, uh, and it's resting on a surface. So that cross cross hatched area is a surface there. So that's our two components, if you like, sliding over each other. The body sliding over the the table or the floor, whatever it's sat on. We've got an applied force to the body. I sometimes call that P. It's going from right to left, as shown on our diagram here. Um, and opposing that, we've got what we call a frictional force. Don't forget, frictional force always opposes the relative motion. So if the motion is a tendency to go left to right, the friction force has to go right to left. It always opposes the motion. Obviously, having a mass uh, in a gravitational field, as we're showing here, we generate the weight force. So we've got a weight force here, mg acting down. Back to Newton's laws here. Uh, Newton's third law will say, well, if you've got the weight force acting down on the surface, you must have an equal and opposite force acting up on the body. And we denote that as the normal force. OK, so in this case, as the diagram shows there, the normal force labeled N is equal to the mass times the gravitational acceleration. So the model that's generated here is in the bolded boxes, what we really need to be aware of. The friction force, my FF on the left-hand side, is simply equal to this mu term I mentioned earlier, which is a coefficient of friction, multiplied by the normal force, the force of the surface, the table here, whatever, the ground on the body itself. That's the reaction force to the weight as it's shown. For most horizontal motion, not all I have to say, but for most horizontal motion, your new, uh, normal force will be the same as the weight force. So if they give you the mass in the question, you can find the weight. You'll know what the normal force is in the question. OK, it does change on the inclined plane and it can sometimes be different on a, on a horizontal surface. But I'll look at that situation later on. In most cases, your normal force will be your weight force. And that little uh, uh, formula at the bottom, FF equals to mu n, is all we need to calculate the frictional force. We need the coefficient of friction, which I'll show you in a moment. And we need the normal force. Uh, just the same model continued here. All I'm doing here is actually transposing the equation. So instead of having FF equals to mu n, you can see I've transposed it uh, and I've labelled it here as the coefficient of friction. Arranging mu is equal to friction force divided by the normal force. And mu is dimensionless. It's, it's just a ratio of one force, the frictional force, over another force, the normal force. In most cases, the coefficient of friction is found on tables, on the internet, in textbooks, reference books, and so on. Um, so in most cases, you look it up. I'm going to do an example in a moment where we'll actually calculate the uh, friction or the friction coefficient. But in most of the questions, as in design practice, you would look them up. There'll be something that's standard. The only thing you sometimes find is they vary. For example, in this table here, it shows you steel on steel. And again, I should emphasize the fact when you're talking about friction, you're talking about friction coefficient between two surfaces. Up to now, you're in, you've always found properties related to a particular material. For example, you might have a tensile strength of steel and a tensile strength of aluminium alloy and tensile strengths of brass or something. You've had tensile strengths for a particular material. But when you're considering coefficients of friction, it's related to a pair of surfaces. So steel rubbing on steel or copper rubbing on steel or cast iron on cast iron. So it goes on. There's always a pair of surfaces. And in textbooks, you sometimes find both static and dynamic friction are labelled. Not so much the dynamic friction, I find. I find them more difficult to obtain. But certainly static friction effects, they're often found relatively easy. And they're denoted sometimes by mu s um, in some textbooks. They're denoted that way. It's mainly the static friction coefficients we're interested in. But be careful if you start to Google um, or look these things up in a textbook, you can find quite significant values. I remember um, looking at my table, I found steel on steel was 0 0.7. And I looked up in another reference book and I found steel on steel was 0 0.2, uh, which is a significant difference between the coefficient of friction. But then when you read the small print, you sometimes find that well, that was with lubrication or that was very clean and dry surfaces. And all this kind of uh, effect can come into play with the um, characteristics of the situation. If I had steel on steel with lubrication, it might be down to you know 0 0.1 or something. So you need to be careful of the situation. But those are typical um, 
friction coefficients. As I said, in most questions, you are given them um, in the question. Okay, let's get into a calculation here. We're going to take you to exercise one here. It says to determine the coefficient of friction. This is actually like an experiment. This is how we would determine the coefficient of friction. For brass on steel, so there's our pair of surfaces. Um, an experiment is set up as shown in the sketch. We've got a mass slider. Uh, carrying uh, various masses is located on a smooth steel surface. We've got masses are added to the hanger. There's a hanger up here connected to the slider there. Um, so we add, we add masses to the hanger until the slider just begins to move. That's what's called the limiting friction effect. When that slider here, this thing here, is just about to move over the steel surface there, that's the limiting condition. That will give us our maximal friction force. That's what we're trying to calculate. They've given us some values. We know that the uh, uh, 50 Newton brass slider just begins to move when the hanger has a mass of one kilogram on it. And we've got to find this mu value, this coefficient of friction for brass on steel. Okay, so that's what we're going to do. So let's have a little diagram of this. Okay, so we're putting masses on the hanger, which is adding masses here um, and just watching for that brass slider to move over the steel plate. That's what we're watching for. We'll give us some information in the question. Let's get the information out of the question. So uh, I told that the brass slider uh, which is 50 newtons. So one kilogram added to the hanger here. We're just seeing, and, and if you're doing this experimental wise, you've kind of got to look very closely to see if that brass is just fractionally moving across the steel plate. And uh, I remember when I was doing it with students, a lot of debate about, oh, is it, isn't is it, all that kind of stuff, you know, and going cross eyed sometimes trying to look at the, the motion of this thing, because you're just looking for a very slight motion, because that means to say you're just overcoming the friction effects. That's a scenario we've got. I'm going to draw my little frictional model up here. Now, for the limiting condition, this is the assumption we often make. We assume that the frictional force is equal to the applied force. For the limiting condition, the frictional force is equal to the applied force. In other words, it's just about to move. So going back to that diagram I showed you a few slides back, this one here, we're at this point here on the diagram, we're at this point here, we're just about to move, we're overcoming a static friction effect, and we're about to put it into the dynamic, dynamic motion. That's the point we're at. So we, we know actually in this case what the uh, friction force is going to be uh, for the static limiting condition, because it's equal to the P. And we know that the mass on the hanger from our experiment is one kilogram. So we can find out what the P force, the frictional force is going to be here, just by multiplying the mass by gravity. So in this case, we're gonna find frictional force, and it's simply going to equal mass times gravity. The frictional force then is actually equal to the mg, and that's going to be the mass on the hanger, it's one kilogram multiplied by 9.81 meters per second squared. So again, it's not so much the calculations that's difficult here, it's more the conceptual understanding of what's going on. And it's all really to do with that limiting condition here. That force P in the cable there is overcoming the frictional force. If I draw on the diagram here, the frictional force. So we can find the frictional force, it's got equal to 9.81 newtons. So that's the sort of understanding you need here to understand that that has to do with the limiting condition that we've got up here. So now we can find the coefficient of friction, which is what the question wants me to find. Let's go and do that now. Find friction coefficient. And don't forget friction coefficient is the mu symbol. So from our previous slide, we transpose the equation to find mu. Mu is simply equal to the frictional force divided by the normal force that's applied from the steel plate on the brass in this case. So our frictional force, we've worked out to be 9.81 newtons. And the normal force, uh, we know up here, is equal and opposite of the weight force in this case, so that's 50 newtons. So I get 0 0.196 for my friction coefficient, 0 0.196. Now if we compare that, if we got that on our table, that was brass on steel. Let's go to the table, just see what it says here. Uh, brass on steel, they get 0 0.15 in the table. So 
We're in the right ballpark for that table. Steel on brass, dry, we're assuming dry in this case. 0.15 in our table, and we got 0.196, okay, so. And that's actually how you will undertake an experiment to find a friction coefficient, that's the kind of thing in, in the lab, that's what we would do. Now, I said in most questions, uh, you actually find you get given the coefficient of friction. If you design office, you're highly unlikely to have to go in, find the friction coefficient from the lab, you'll find it in reference sources, whether on the internet or hard copy, and that's what most of the questions will refer to. So I'm going to go through question one, which all question one is trying to do is get us to use the formula for friction and just rearrange it in its various formats and use it. And then the questions will build up on that as we go through. Fill in the blanks table really here. All right. So I've got to use the formula, the friction formula FF equal to mu N and fill in the missing entries in the table. They've got different scenarios here. We've got PTFE upon PTFE for our first scenario. And that's a kind of plastic polytetrafluoroethylene, I think it's called. Normal car tire and ice is the second scenario, and the third scenario is this steel on brass scenario. And what they've done in the table is to just give us two of the three variables. So we've got to sort of transpose the equation in some cases. One, let's do PTFE on PTFE. Uh, we've got to work out the frictional force here. That's what it's showing here. We don't know what the frictional force is in this particular box here, and that's a straight use of the equation. So frictional force is equal to the mu. Uh, the mu is given is 0.04 here, just reading the information in the table, and we're multiplying that by the normal force, and that's given us 400 newtons. So that gives us, calculating uh, numbers there, 16 newtons. So the frictional force there required, uh, based on the um, very low coefficient of friction, isn't it? Static friction for coefficient, they're giving us 0.04, really low. And that gives us 16 newtons force required in this case. Two, we've got a car tire on to be rubber on ice really won't it so that wants us to transpose the equation because in this question we're trying to find the normal force the n value so i need to transpose my equation just be careful um, with your transpositions from some friction force is equal to mu n we've got to find n so so rearranging for the normal force n, that's equal to the friction force divided by the coefficient of friction mu. Inserting the values, the friction force is 7 kilonewtons in our table, and the coefficient of friction is 0 0.1 from our table. So the normal force required for scenario 2 is 70 kilonewtons. I'll let you consider scenario 3, steel rubbing on brass. In this case, we have to find the coefficient of friction, the mu term, but we've shown that transposition on the previous slide. So I'll let you consider scenario three. So there's my transposition for scenario three. The mu is equal to the friction force divided by n. Inserting the values, I get a mu value of 0 0.15. Again, another variation of the value for the friction coefficient of steel on brass. Question two, we've got a, a car here. Brakes of a car are applied suddenly, so that means the wheels are locking here, and then the car is starting to skid. So that's the scenario. If the mass of the car is one ton, you be careful with that, we've got to find the retarding force, that's a frictional force on the car effectively. Okay, and they give it two scenarios. Um, we've got clean and dry tarmac. Okay, and also we've got the uh, car sliding on ice. So, and in the question, I've got mu value given for both parts. We've got the mu value for part A, 0.9, and we've got the mu value uh, for part B, which is 0.1. Okay, so two different mu values. So it's just the same formula undertaken twice. So let's have a little diagram, shall we, see what we can do. So we've just got two scenarios to deal with. The uh, first one, which is on clean and dry tarmac. So if I do the first one, I'll let you do the second one. So just rubber on tarmac. So my frictional force will simply be the mu n, and it's going to be the mu for the first part is 0 0.9. That's multiplied by the normal force, but so I'm working out here, that'll be the weight force. So let me do the weight force. I'll do it over here, I haven't done it yet. So the weight force is equal to mg as always. So that's going to be equal to my thousand times my 9.81. Okay, that's 9810, and that would be now Newtons, don't forget, of course, we've put it to wait for, so now Newtons there. That's my W. So, 9810. 
left here. Um, cool, the answer is 8829. I'll let you do the calculation. It looks about right, 8829. Of course, that's Newton's as well. So that's a frictional force. All right, and then you, you have a go at part two, which is the rubber on ice. I'll let you do that. Same kind of thing, just working out the friction force. So friction force is mu n. So only 981 newtons, it says. So I'll let you check that out for yourself. 981 newtons is what I'm looking for there. Okay. And question three is a wooden cabinet. Mass is 200 kilograms. is pushed across the room. Uh, we're, so we're given the coefficient of friction. It's 0 0.4 in this case. We've got to determine the force exerted to push it across the room. They, they say ignore tipping effects because, of course, things can tip over. But we're ignoring that. We're assuming that wouldn't happen here. So, again, you just need to work out the normal force. So there will be a weight force acting down. Go back to my model. Simply a weight force acting down. Uh, equal and opposite normal force acting up. That's from the floor on the cabinet. Newton's third law. Um, and we've got to find what the force required. We're assuming that P is equal to F again. The limiting condition is what we're assuming here, okay? Just be careful. You've got to work out the, the weight first of all, haven't you? So do the weight force first of all. All right, I assume you're okay with that one. Let's have a look at this one. Question four. A bit more tricky, this one. Brings in Newton's second law. It hints in the question there. In actual fact, if you understood Newton's second law, and I know it's difficult, Newton's second law. I know most students do struggle with it, but I know some of you have been looking at the videos and having to go at it. So I'm hoping you develop your knowledge a bit with it. Uh, but it is difficult. Um, but this is actually a very similar problem uh, that we've already studied. Different context, maybe, but a very similar problem. Um, it's just that in this case, we've got to calculate the frictional force, whereas in the previous lecture, we were actually given the resisting forces. And so, so that's, that's where it's different. So let's look at question four. Question four, we've got a cast iron machine tool, uh, carriage, um, has a mass of 200 kilograms, and it moves over a cast iron slide. We've got to determine the total force, that's our mission, find the total force required to give the sliding member a uniform acceleration, oh, go, acceleration of two meters per second squared. We've got to take the coefficient of friction there as 0.15, and it hints about the second law. So, I feel a free body diagram coming on. I don't know about you guys, but when I get these kind of questions, I want a free body diagram. Let's have a free body diagram in my carriage. Okay, we know it's a new second law problem because we've got acceleration in the system. So, let's go through the process and sort of recap what we did. In our previous lecture, so let's um, let's apply Newton's laws of motion. Let's apply a second law. It's summation of all the forces. That capital sigma summation of all the forces acting. They must equal to the mass times acceleration. Now we need a sign convention, of course. Sorry, I normally take the acceleration direction as a positive, so I'll do that here. Don't have to, but I'm going to. So on Newton's second law, what do I do? I just simply add up the forces, the red arrows on my diagram, add them up and equate them to MA. So let's do that. Well, my forces, I've got P, which is positive. And in this case, I'm going to take away my frictional force. And nothing else to consider their forces. So that must equal to mass times acceleration. Now let's see what we know, what we don't know. Uh, we don't know the P because we're trying to find the P. It wants us to find, determine the total force required. So we've got to find P. That's done. Actually, we don't know the frictional force at the moment, but we can find it because um, we know the frictional coefficient is given in as 0.15, and we've got the mass, so we can find the, the weight force and the normal force. So actually, we do have we do have the FF. We've got the mass, and we've got the itself. We've got everything we need. We just need to find that frictional force first of all. So let's do that. Let's find the frictional force. That's equal to mu multiplied by the normal force. So I need to work out the weight force of the object, and that will give me the normal force. So on my free body, I'll put that weight down. It doesn't come into the Newton's second law, but I do need it from the friction effect. So I'm going to put my uh, W, my normal force on there. So I can do it all at once if I want to. So the mu in this case will be 0 0.15 given in the question and that's multiplied by the normal force which will be equal and opposite to the weight force okay so in this case I can just put that down as 200 multiplied by 9.81 so I'll put it into the equation you can do it separately if you want to in fact it's probably better to work out the weight force separately I think it's, it looks better on the calculation really but 
I'll save myself time there and I'll put it like that. So that's 194 newtons for my frictional force. We're finding a frictional force here. And then step three, I'm going to find P. By rearranging the above equation, it will simply be MA, add my frictional force. The mass we know is 200, the acceleration 2, and I add to that and add 294. So I end up with um, 694 newtons is the total force required to 1 overcome friction effects of the carriage actually um, resting on that slide overcome the friction effects and then I need to overcome the inertia of the carriage to accelerate it up to the two meters per second squared. So that's a bit of Newton's second law coming in and if you if you could compare that solution to what we did in the previous lecture on Newton's second law it actually is the same approach there. The only thing that's different is instead of them giving us the frictional force as a resisting force they're now saying calculate it. You've got the knowledge now to calculate the frictional force and that's what we've done there. We've calculated it. I will let you have an attempt at question five. Here a steel block is dragged across the floor with a force of 0.7 kilonewtons. The mass of the block is given as 75 kilograms. You've got to determine the coefficient of friction between the block and the floor. The answer is given in the bracket here. Question six is in two parts. The first part has a large casting of mass 100 kilograms. It rests on a horizontal surface and we're given the coefficient of friction mu is 0.2. We've got to find the horizontal force needed to move the casting at a constant velocity. So that's a case of just using the friction equals mu n to find the friction force required. And that would actually be the dynamic friction force in this case because we're moving at constant velocity. In part B, there's an additional 200 newtons downwards force applied to the casting. And we've got to find now what the horizontal force required is going to be. And what they're trying to highlight to you in that part of the question is that the frictional force is directly proportional to the mass of the object or the weight force, if you like, acting down. So there's adding a 200 newtons downward force that will increase the normal force and by definition, then that will increase the frictional force. And that's what you're trying to find. The answers for part A and part B are shown in the brackets. I'll let you attempt that question. Question seven, could I outline this to you? It's quite an interesting question, but a quite a complex question to understand here. So I'm going to explain this to you as best I can. So a component of eight kilograms is to be placed on a magnetic chuck for surface grinding. You sometimes see these machines in the workshop. You may want to skim the top face of a component so you can't clamp it down. You need to grind across the entire surface. So often the component is placed on a magnetic chuck and a magnetic force helps keep the component down while the grinding wheel moves across the surface and, and, and skims the surface. We're given that the coefficient of static friction is 0.15 in this situation. We've got to find the minimum normal force that's provided by the magnetic chuck if the grinding wheel applies a horizontal force of 30 newtons to the piece of work or the component. So going back to what we did a few weeks ago in a previous lecture, I'm going to apply Newton's first law here. Why the first law? Well, because the component that's on the magnetic chuck is actually stationary. It's the wheel that moves over the component. The, the machine table shown here is actually stationary. So it's a first law problem because we're not accelerating the component itself. The component's just seeing the applied force P to its surface. So let's draw a free body diagram of the component sat on the magnetic chuck and, and all the forces applied. Okay, so here's my free body diagram of the component and all the forces acting on it. So obviously we've got an applied force here from the cutting tool. It's 30 newtons, said in the question, I've shown that right to left here. And opposing that, we'll actually have two frictional forces. We will have the frictional force I've labeled as FFC, which is the frictional force from the component itself due to its own weight force, giving a reactive normal force, and so a frictional force. 
And we've also got this additional friction of force, which the magnetic chuck will induce to help keep the component on the table. Now, if you think of the big picture here, if the component was really, really large, had a large mass, it would have a big enough weight force and, and hence normal force that would generate enough friction to withstand the 30 newton force right to left. However, in this particular case, it's only eight kilograms, so it will not generate enough force to keep the component on the table when a force of 30 newtons is applied to it. So we need that additional frictional force from the magnetic chuck, and so we need that additional normal force from the magnetic chuck. And that's what the question wants you to find. That's the unknown in this particular question. What is the normal force generated by the magnetic chuck? So looking at the two frictional force components that we have here, we have a frictional force from the component itself. I've labeled that as FFC here, FFC on my free body diagram. And we calculate that in the same way we have the other questions. That's the mu coefficient of friction multiplied by the normal force acting on the component. And that would be equal and opposite to the weight force. The weight force in this case is 78.5 newtons. So 0.15 coefficient of friction given in the question multiplied by the 78.5. That gives me a frictional force from the component of 11.775 newtons. Now that frictional force is not enough to counteract the 30 newton force that's applied from the grinding wheel on the components. So at the moment this would fly off the table because the frictional force generated by the component self weight effectively cannot react the 30 newton force applied. So we need a, an additional frictional force. I've called that FFM here, and that's the frictional force from the magnetic chuck. So the frictional force from the magnetic chuck, FFM I've called it, is equal to the coefficient of friction again, but this time it's multiplied by the normal force, and that's what the question wants to find. The question wants to find what is this normal force that the magnetic chuck has to exert to generate the friction required. So that's the unknown. So what I'm going to do now is apply Newton's first law here to my free body diagram. The first law because the component's not accelerating, it's actually stationary on the magnetic chuck. And then from that I'll be able to work out the normal force required. So apply Newton's first law. So that is equal to summation of all the forces, but this time they have to equal to zero. So summing up the forces on the left hand side, for my free body diagram, if I assume right to left is positive, then I would have P, the applied force, minus the friction force that's generated by the component's weight, minus the friction force that's generated from the magnetic chuck. And that has to equal to zero. Simply rearranging, P is equal to the frictional force from the component, added to the frictional force from the magnetic jack. Inserting the values, we know that the P is equal to 30 newtons, given in the question. We've calculated the frictional force from the component above. It's 11.775 newtons. And we add to that the frictional force from the magnetic chuck, and above that states that it's 0.15 multiplied by the normal force from the magnetic chuck. We can now clearly see there's just one unknown in the one equation, the normal force from the magnetic chuck. So we just rearrange the equation. So therefore the normal force from the magnetic chuck is equal to 30 minus 11.775 and it's all divided by 0.15. That equals to 121.5 newtons. So there's the full solution for question 7. Quite a complicated question. Again, start with the free body diagram, extract all the information, calculate the appropriate values, and then apply, in this case, Newton's first law. The first law, because this is the equilibrium condition, there's no acceleration in the system. So all the forces, when you add them up on the free body, they must equal to zero. I'll leave you with some further questions. Question 8, 
you've got to find the acceleration that's produced when a piston exerts a force of 500 newtons on a mass of 25 kilograms. It rests on a horizontal surface and you're given the coefficient of friction. It's 0.5. Because of the acceleration here, this will be a Newton's second law problem. So apply Newton's second law here. You've got the force applied. You can work out the frictional force, given the information in the question. You can rearrange then to find the acceleration. The answer is given here. And in question 9, a curling stone of mass 10 kilograms travels a distance of 20 meters across the ice before coming to rest. We're well, given the coefficient of friction is 0 0.015. We've got to find the velocity of the stone as it leaves the curler's hand. We can assume that the retardation force due to the friction effects is uniform. The hint in the question to apply Newton's second law, F equals MA, and then apply Newton's equation of motion, V squared equals U squared plus 2AS. As a hint here, you'll be able to find the frictional force from the information given. From that, you'll be able to use Newton's second law to find the acceleration. And then from that, you can use Newton's equation of motion to find the initial velocity. Again, I'll let you review that question at your own pace. The answer for initial velocity is shown in the bracket here. And finally, I'll leave you with question 10. I'll let you review that yourself and attempt the three parts to the question. The answer is given in the bracket here.